going to be discussing some of the practices that we've tried to inhabit in being more inclusive in our own work and some of the challenges that that's given us and what we might advise other people to do in order for them to perhaps not face the challenges that we've faced in quite such a harsh way. So I'm coming to you first, Louise. Tell me a little bit about how you're trying to embed inclusion within your practice. Obviously, we're talking about the research context yes. as university researchers. So we try and do our research in participatory ways. So that means using co-design, so the way we conceive of projects, how we carry them out. So working with youth co-researchers, practitioner co-researchers, how we then interpret those um, findings together uh, through co-analysis and the sorts of outputs that we produce. So we're trying to sort of thread it through um, the way we practice research, but also the sorts of things we're making from it uh, to, try and, to try and help support more inclusive change. I mean, it sounds fantastic, and it sounds as though it's a really good step to making research much more relevant and purposeful. But you find that challenging, or are you, I mean, has it been plain sailing, or? No, I'd say challenging. <laughs> I think, I think um, often within our traditional funding structures, doing this sort of work that's a bit more open-ended, it's a bit more risky. You don't necessarily go into it knowing exactly what you're going to come out of. So it does need um, a funding that, that allows for that, and that gives you that flexibility to build relationships and build trust and, and build the process together. Um, let me come to you, um, Jude. Um, tell me a little bit about how you've tried to embed inclusionary practice into your research. Yeah, so in the context of community-engaged research, there's a lot of co-production, as Louise said. There's a lot of bringing together different types of researcher and trying to reconcile often really diverse sets of interests, of knowledge experience, of languages and values, which can be really challenging. And I think being able to hold that conflict and give space for those conflicts to be aired is really important, almost as much as then being able to develop some kind of consensus and shared way of going forward. And, and there are certain skills you need, aren't there, to hold that kind of space, uh, you know, that emergent space where perhaps people don't have the same, the same ideas about what they're trying to get out of the work that you're doing together. Do you, could you describe any of the skills that you've learned to enable you to manage that? Absolutely. I think, I think somebody referred to it as knowledge curation. Mm -hmm. So being able to sit with different knowledges, being able to be in a way the idiot in the room who doesn't speak any of the languages particularly well, but is able to translate for others the languages they themselves don't understand. Um, and I think also trust and relationships is absolutely crucial. And in the context of the community work that I do, these have been built up. We have a shared context on the estate. Our children are growing up together. We have relationships and friendships which extend outside of the research, which I know is problematic often in academic research. And that's why sometimes that doesn't work for us. But at the same time, it gives you the opportunities to really understand and respond to vulnerabilities and to make sure that the work you're doing together is responsible and has the flexibility to allow people to drop in and to drop out, to change their part type of participation depending on their life circumstances and to have that flexibility. And that often isn't available in traditional funding sources. So it, for me, it starts with a conversation, you know, with understanding what people want from research, what, what are their drivers, because people will have different drivers and, and sometimes they will be in conflict. You know, Jude mentioned, you know, holding the conflict and that really resonated with me because that's something that we're often doing in our roles is that we're kind of holding these divergent opinions and perspectives and also expectations as well, mm. you know, and, and when you're holding those expectations, you have to think carefully about how you're going to manage that because you know a lot of people that we work with are fed up of being let down and displaced mm. and, and not respected and dehumanized and, and and so that's what you're working with as your mm. starting point it's mm. let you um pour it out comes to care mm. that people have suffered mm. so you know there are so many drivers behind it that we need to understand mm. And so start with that conversation, which is with empathy. Mm -hmm. And then think about what can I do? You know, we can't change the world, but what can I do in my space to make things better? So um, 
the viewers of this programme, what could they, you know, what tip would you give them? I, I think where we always start when we work with um, educational practitioners is to say, be ready to sit with discomfort um, and to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because often our natural reaction is to not want to be uncomfortable, but usually it's discomfort can be a really good sign that you're, you're hitting on those aspects of privilege. And would you say that the majority of your time when doing inclusive practice is uncomfortable? I mean, is that like the, the, t the typical feeling of... Yeah, I think because what we're talking about is disrupting the status quo, disrupting business as usual. Um, and so that has to, you know, so like if we're working with practitioners, maybe what they do is great in lots of ways, but it may not necessarily be inclusive. And so if we're not prepared to change, then, you know, it's, we, we have to have some sort of discomfort around that to know that we're going in the right direction. We have to check our motives, mm. you know, so what are we what are we really doing this for and who mm. are we really doing this for and the degree to which people engage with us. Mm. And, and we hear this a lot, don't we, from communities that say, I'm tired of researchers just coming out because you want to hear my voice and then I never see you again. Mm. You don't attribute my comments to your research papers. There's a lack of respect. And I feel used, mm. so actually I'm not going to engage with you anymore. You know, and, and that's the reality. So we've got to check our motives, mm. and we've got to be careful of the and mindful of the the hurt relationship, mm. okay, and the hurt relationships that exist, uh, and start rebuilding that mm. through the self reflection, you know, the introspection mm. um, piece. Yeah, because we're not stand, starting from a standing start, are we? You know, like, actually, there's a history to all of these relationships that, that you need to be mindful of when you're bringing any group of people together. Absolutely. I agree completely. I think that sort of self-awareness is really key. But also the sense of you belonging to a much broader community, whether it's a movement around a particular issue, whether it's a network focused on a specific research or policy agenda, and just be a bit honest about what you can achieve and where the limits of that are when it's time to hand over to someone else who might be better placed to bring their knowledge and expertise than you, who might be more in need of funding than you in order to do work that you could do in another way or not at all. So it's sort of thinking, situating yourself in a context, in a broader set of networks and being honest about where your work makes most sense and when it's time to either be an ally to other people, support other people or hand over completely to other people to do that work. I really love that because I think often, you know, universities have been in a very privileged position and they often are used to convening the conversation, holding the conversation, acting on the conversation and being the arbiters of what good looks like within that conversation. And actually that sense of actually sometimes it's about bringing our work alongside others who are doing excellent work over here where perhaps a little bit of what we're doing is relevant or useful and that can accelerate the work that they're doing. What's your hope for from this work? What's your hope that others will perhaps do as a consequence of the work that you're doing? I think for me, it's a hope about really thinking about the context of practice, thinking about how the impact of the research that you're going to be doing is going to affect change. As Faye said, it's having that change in mind, but also being mindful of potential challenges or risks of the of the impact of the research contributing to greater inequalities i think stop and think and be prepared to shift i think a lot of the time so uh, we work in the the field of widening participation in stem in science technology engineering and maths and there's a lot of resource there's a lot of goodwill there but sometimes i think we see things get done because either that's how they've always been done or how we think we want them to be done and i think just stopping reflecting and being prepared to listen to other viewpoints and shift would be really valuable my hope is that there will be a level of agility that is linked to integrity because that has to be our foundational piece the integrity for me is the kind of the is the essence mm. You know, are we acting with integrity in the decisions that we are making? Are we acting with integrity when we engage with diverse communities? Are we acting with integrity when we invite them into different spaces to have conversations about our work? The integrity piece has got to be the essence 
of what, who we are what, and how we operate.